You're listening to the Pure Portugal podcast with news and information from and for the Pure Portugal community. Find out more on Facebook or at pureportugal.co.uk. Hello, this is Carl Munson and welcome to the Pure Portugal podcast, episode four, late summer 2018. And it's for those of you who like a longer form immersive experience, which brings together recent weekly episodes that have looked at progressive community living, cooperative hemp growing and the sweet orange comfort food known as baked beans. As ever, your feedback is very welcome. So do drop me a line to carl at carlmunson.com. So without further ado, let's go to our first segment which takes us way down to the hot, sunny south of Portugal. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. One intentional community that chose to go together some 40 years ago is Tamera, based in Portugal's Alentejo region on an impressive and innovative 335-acre site that is addressing such big issues as how will humanity live in the future? How can we, as humanity, resolve the crises we've caused and survive on Earth? Can this planet become the paradise it's meant to be? Here's head of Tamera's global campus, Vera Kleinhammers. We've been working with these questions since 1978, researching the foundations of a non-violent culture, experimenting with how the world that we create can become compatible with the world that has created us. Taking a holistic approach, we've been addressing the basic areas of human life. Samira is described as a peace research village with the goal of becoming a self-sufficient, sustainable and duplicable communitarian model for non-violent cooperation and cohabitation between humans, animals, nature and creation for a future of peace for all. Continuing with Tamara's Wikipedia listing, it's also often called a healing biotope. Literally translated, biotope simply means a place where life lives. In Tamara, however, healing biotope is also described as a greenhouse of trust, an acupuncture point of peace and a self-sufficient future community. Here's Vera again. We are establishing what we call a healing biotope showing that we can in fact live together in cooperation and trust, honoring the earth and all that lives. In a healing biotope, all different social and ecological solutions are fused into a unified system, a blueprint for a possible post-capitalist society. Through the Healing Biotopes Plan, we seek to support global system change, bringing together a planetary community around a shared vision. Now, the originators of Tamira were Dieter Dum, with a background in psychoanalysis and sociology, Sabine Lichtenfels, a theologian, and Rainer Ehrenpreis, a physicist, who left their professional lives in Germany and tried to create an interdisciplinary research centre to find solutions to the ecological and technological problems the world was facing at the time. In 1983, they began a three-year social experiment with 50 participants in the Black Forest of Germany. And ultimately, they finally established Tamera in Portugal in 1995, where they continued their research into the core human relationship questions that lay hidden under all issues and prevent real solutions, such as competition, greed and jealousy. Approximately 250 co-workers and students of all ages now live and study in Tamera, which operates as an experimental research centre dedicated to discovering how human beings can live peacefully among themselves and with nature and create a successful, working and sustainable community. Tamera also serves as the headquarters for a range of independent projects. It's like a community of communities, including these many and impressive initiatives. Right, beginning with the global campus designed to offer knowledge in community development as well as the basic principles of decentralised energy supply, architecture and ecology. And Monticero Peace Education, a three-year course of study offering a comprehensive understanding for the development of globally effective peace villages. The Grace Foundation, established in 2007 to redirect and attract money towards peace projects rather than war. The Institute for Global Peacework, IGP, a network of peace workers and peace initiatives with an annual summer university and think tank. 
Tamara also hosts the Verlag Maiga Publishing Company that disseminates the knowledge and experience of over 30 years of research into the development of the plan of the healing biotopes. There's the Children's Centre with the basic principle of the education of perception at its heart. The Love School, love without jealousy, sexuality without fear, faithfulness that is not broken when one loves and desires others, truth and longevity in love and new pathways in partnerships are the focus of the Love School, which suggests that there cannot be peace among nations as long as there is war between man and woman. Also, the Solar Village, a test site in Tamera, creating a model village that will be self-sufficient in energy and food production for 50 people that can be built without any assistance from big energy companies. And there's the Permaculture Project, where an ecological team has made ponds and oasis and planted about 20,000 trees, featuring Sepp Holzer, known as the Agro Rebel, who is cooperating with Tamera to build a sustainable lakescape in the dry Alentejo region of Portugal, surrounded by a self-sufficient edible landscape with trees, gardens and wetlands. There's the Horse Project, a new way of cooperation between human and horse to promote inner growth and to increase the ability to be in intimate contact with animals. The horses are ridden without bits or saddles, which requires trust and sensitive communication. Terra Nova Movement, this is the global platform that has arisen from the ideas of Dieter Dumm and Sabine Lichtenfels, and from the real experience of Tamera. Terra Nova aims to create the conditions for a global system change for a non-violent earth through activism, education and networking, and by spreading perspectives for profoundly non-violent culture based on trust and cooperation. Tamera also has a seminar and guest centre offering visitors the possibility to get to know Tamera, its grounds and its research activities. So you can find out more about Tamara's inspiring and amazing research, education and outreach at www.tamara.org. Now Tamara, of course, is just one of many communities who've come together in Portugal to explore and bring about a specific shift in how we understand life and live together in perhaps a more functional and sustainable way. I hope to share more about such projects in the weeks and months ahead. Looking forward to the future, we return to Vera now and her message in Tamara's introductory video. Incubating centers and regions around the world to model a new system that can make the existing one obsolete. We invite you all, let's collaborate, let's defend the sacred, let's lead the transition into a regenerative and more peaceful world. Carl Munson for the Pure Portugal podcast and uh, a real stir was created last weekend actually. The Lusicana Cooperative posted up, it is done for the production of Industrial Hemp in Portugal. That's the Lusicana Cooperative founded yesterday, that would have been last Friday, an auspicious day, uh, August the 24th. In the sweltering heat of a typical Alentejo summer day in Serpa, the six founders are currently producing hemp in Alentejo, Algarve and Castelo Branco area. One of our main goals is to enable as many farmers as possible to join this exciting market. If you're interested in becoming part of the emerging hemp industry in Portugal, keep tabs on Lusicana. We will be open for new members starting next season. And then... Three over 350 people liked and loved that post. A hundred comments. Uh, I have Jurgen on the phone, who's part of the cooperative. What a stir you've created! People are loving this, Jurgen. Yes, uh, I'm a bit surprised myself. Uh, although I was slightly prepared for it by the uh, amount of people that turned up to the meeting uh, that you know started this whole affair last December in Castelo Branco. That was a physical meeting uh, in the library, and uh, almost a hundred people turned up which was uh, quite a turnout. I expected to be something like 30 people or so. So I'm, I'm not all that surprised. Yeah, and there's such a love of this plant. Is that why this is occurring? Is it because it's as though the scales of justice around hemp are being rebalanced and people's love of this plant is now sort of being justified and validated? Is that how you see it? Well, I suppose that's part of the equation. Um, I mean, the plan has been done a great injustice, as you say, uh, but even without throwing in any uh, moral categories here, uh, it's just this usefulness is becoming a widespread fact. I think that's what uh, mostly is what people latch on to. It's something that people can create in their own backyard, you know, where they can be part of, uh, and it's incredibly useful. Yeah. And it becomes less and less obvious why it should be prohibited. 
Yes, indeed. If you scratch the surface, that becomes so obvious, doesn't it? That like we should be using this plant because it can be used for just about everything. When you, when when you see sort of real fans posting up lists of uh, applications for hemp, you become aware that it got sort of marginalised. Maybe a hundred years ago, would that be right? I mean, you you know a lot more about this than me, but the the mm. uses are so obvious and so manifold that it's like, well, why aren't we using it? Uh, I don't know if you want to go into that right now and and, and speak of some of the uses and and, and speak of, of of hemp's history a little, a little bit. Mm. Yes, I can do. I think uh, it is by now common knowledge that uh, that the prohibition of hemp started with the emerging uh, plastic industry. Uh, you know, when oil uh, became chemically uh, a chemical basis for producing plastics of all kinds, many of the things that plastic was pushing into um, were previously made out of hemp and more. Uh, and uh, at the same time, we had this situation where the alcohol prohibition in uh, in the USA was coming to an end, and we had this whole uh, bureaucracy build up a huge apparatus uh, of uh, of prosecution uh, that suddenly found itself without a job. And there was a personal connection between person in the Ford family and Anslinger, the leader of the bureaucracy, uh, the prohibition agency, basically, and they appear to have made a deal. And so, in order to curb uh, the hemp competition to plastics, uh, hemp became a prohibited plant. You can uh, probably remember this Reefer Madness movie that is, you know, a historical fact, mm. which is absolutely crazy about the effects of uh, of marijuana and all of that. So, it, it it was simply an economical move, like so many things in uh, in America. Yeah, and a, a cruel uh, twist of fate, right? That has had such a massive yes. implication on on on. Yes, it had the prohibition uh, mindset that was created uh, like five generations ago is still haunting us today. There is a, of course, now that the trends reversing a little bit, people are very impatient to to reverse that and to unwind that. But uh, I have to advise some caution here, yeah. um, because this is a very old programming by now, uh, if you think about it, uh, and it won't go away quickly. So we have to exercise a certain amount of patience and also uh, forgiveness to those that uh, cling to the old ways and and can't let go of this um, of this mad idea about about marijuana and cannabis. Oh, well said. Well said. Yeah, I think that's really really important in any transition and change, isn't it? An amount of forgiveness as as people sort of wake up and there's a dawning uh, realization or reemergence of the power of some of these things that have been suppressed. For those who might still be struggling a little bit with the conditioning, and let's face it, we all are to some extent. What are the uses of uh, hemp that people are so uh, excited about? From from the experience or uh, feedback that people gave me, I think the the main uh, interest at the moment is using it for uh, medicinal purposes. Uh, hemp has a certain amount of CBD that can be extracted from it. Uh, CBD is one of the the spectrum of cannabinoids uh, opposed to THC, which is the psychoactive component. And uh, industrial hemp allows you to uh, harness CBD without getting problems from the psychoactive components, which is uh, what the legislation currently hinges on. And uh, there are many uses in the medical realm uh, for CBD. For example, epilepsy, uh, it's a very good anti-inflammatory. Uh, it treats pain very effectively. Uh, it's an anxiolytic. Uh, it has shown some anti-tumor properties as well. It works with psoriasis, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, migraines. Uh, it has a lot of uh, problems that can be helped uh, using it. It's amazing. And this is why people are impatient, I guess. Yes, I suppose so. And uh, I can tell you how I got into this because this is my main motivator as well. So 2017 was a very difficult personal year for me and I got it for many other people as well for some reason. And uh, uh, some problem that I had uh, like 20 years ago re-emerged. I had an epileptic attack, a grand mal attack uh, here in my garden. And uh, it it was very difficult because it... It creates this sort of uh, stress syndrome afterwards where you're not sure of yourself, whether you can go out and, uh, you know, might it hit you again and so on. And uh, uh, I know from, from 20 years ago when I, when I had this problem first, it was very difficult to get it under control, uh, especially the, the anxieties that follow the problem. With the CBD extract, uh, I got, I don't know exactly how I, how I got to that, but 
somehow I got to try it out, and it worked like a charm, like a charm. It was absolutely marvelous. Uh, it suppressed all the all the uh, epileptic syndromes. It quelled the anxieties, uh, and it uh, created a great healing process. Uh, before I struggled ten years to get back on my feet. And this time I'm organizing all of this. I'm doing all of this uh, after only a few months uh, after this happened. Uh, is a great it has great healing properties. Oh, so uh, when when I realized that and I started to experiment more with it, people that had and from inflammations and things like that, uh, like my wife from uh, overworking her, her crocheting hands, uh, the extract worked like a charm. Brilliant. I quickly, yeah, I quickly realized that that there was a reason the uh, pharma industry is trying to crack down so hard on this. This is when I decided to uh, to go up against it. Mm. And the way, the best way to go up against it, obviously, is to grow it and uh, to push. And that is when I organized a meeting in December uh, in Castelo Branco. And uh, yeah, we grow, grow our first crop this year and uh, see where this goes. This is amazing. And, and other people want to do that, don't they? And I suppose get involved in the way that the tradition in Portugal is, you know, like an a olive oil cooperative. People grow and put into the, the, the bulk crop, yeah, and, and, and share the dividends and the benefits that come about. Is that how it's going to work? Yes, yes. The economical benefits to Portugal would be uh, incredible. I mean, uh, okay, let's let's say Colorado is a good example for uh, full legislation. Uh, they uh, in 2015 there are 5.6 million people in Colorado, and in uh, 2015 they made 125 million dollars from tax on cannabis. Amazing. Okay, that is amazing. Uh, and Portugal has uh, almost 10 million. I think it's probably a little less with all the the migration. Uh, at the same time, all of that is basically concentrated in the coastal areas and the big cities and the interior country, uh, which is painfully obvious to anybody who uh, drives around the villages here, is overaged and uh, it's emptying. Yeah. So uh, another big motivator to introduce this uh, is that with the current surge in, uh, in hemp, this could be a great crop uh, for this country, which has great conditions to grow it, especially uh, with regard to CBD based on the amount of sun, the latitude and so on, yeah. uh, which increases the content of the CBD. Uh, and uh, that is one, one of the goals of Lusicana. It's a, it's a cooperative with a rather heavy agenda on social uh, issues. So one of the goals, even though it's a bit high at the moment, is to help revitalize uh, the interior. You got to imagine what kind of people would jump uh, at the chance to uh, start a hemp uh, farm. Um, a lot of the people that are currently out of the country working shitty jobs somewhere in France, in Switzerland, uh, probably have land from their parents uh, that are currently fallow, not used at all. And uh, they, could, they could get a chance to come back to the country, be with their families again, uh, if uh, they have a chance to make a decent living here. Yeah. What a vision. So, uh, initially, of course, uh, we are, we're in this sort of gold rush situation right now where hemp is hyped to hell. <laughs> and uh, I expect, of course, that uh, initially there will be some people making a lot of money out of this. But uh, the Lusicana goal is more long term. Uh, what we want is to create a sustainable uh, branch, economical branch here in Portugal uh, that allows many people to uh, get on. Of course, the more CBD will be produced, the more hemp will be produced, the prices will get a bit lower. But uh, if you have a large group of people working together in a cooperative, you can help to stabilize uh, the price level as well. Yeah. And this is very important, and I'll tell you why. At the moment, we have large corporations uh, pushing into Portugal for uh, producing hemp here. Uh, there are $20 million, $5 million investments coming from Canada, uh, coming from Israel, uh, which has a long history in medical, condition, uh, medical cannabis, by the way, uh, more than 20 years research uh, in, in uh, Israel. And uh, they are trying to establish a foothold here. So if Portugal uh, would be delivered uh, in terms of hemp industry in the hands of these uh, few big players, uh, of course, they would do what any capitalist operation would do. 
minimize their cost, which means the people that are producing over here would get less and less out of it. Mm. And uh, that's another reason why the Lusicana Cooperative is here and trying to embrace as many growers as possible uh, to create a, a stable counterbalance to this uh, large corporate interest. This is such an amazing reflection of the times we're living in isn't it because i think not only has uh, cannabis got its sort of pr thing you know the, its reputation and how it's been besmirched and, and and ruined in the past but there's also something of that within cooperatives as well i think and how we do business but yes. i think people are awakening to the fact that it's i mean you've only got to look at eucalyptus haven't you to see how a corporation um mm. creates an unholy situation for the people who yes. actually have to live near it or buy it or you know and, and it just benefits the few this is the kind of one percent 99 percent thing going on again and it's I so inspiring to hear, hear what you're saying sorry to interrupt you not there, at all. but i don't think that uh, is not exactly the truth with eucalyptus uh, as far as i understand it eucalyptus was introduced uh, basically to be used by anybody who has land and it is used uh, by a lot of people this is not uh, the paper industry obviously is the main benefactor of the situation, but it was also one of the things you could actually make money out of otherwise useless land. Yeah. And uh, the fact that it, uh, once you chop it down, it grows back threefold, uh, it grows very fast, uh, and so on. In an economically deprived country, uh, you know, is uh, is a straw for many people to to clutch onto. Yeah. So again, uh, we can point a finger at the people growing the uh, eucalyptus, but a much better alternative uh, would be to show them uh, a different way. And uh, with hemp, for example, hemp versus eucalyptus is an interesting comparison. Um, if you have uh, fiber uh, production, hemp fiber production, you sow it in a very dense way. You can produce five times the amount of, uh, of cellulose out of the same patch uh, than you can out of eucalyptus at less than half the water consumption. It's got to be done, isn't it? Yes, but there are drawbacks to it. Uh, eucalyptus grows on, on very poor soil. Uh, hemp needs uh, a lot more in terms of fertilization. Yeah. So there's always, the other, there's always a balance here. There's always a drawback here. Sure. But given the fire damage, uh, and given all that we've been through, especially in 2017 with the fires over here, uh, I think that is something that uh, the politicians over here should, uh, should think about and maybe create some incentives. Well, how's that going? I mean, that's the big question, isn't it? Because so much of this relies on the awareness, education and compliance or acceptance of people at governmental level. How, how have you found that? Um, we've been mainly in touch with regulatory bodies over here uh, who are wholly sympathetic to the cause. Uh, we are also uh, talking to the local um, representatives of the Ministry of Agriculture, who, again, have, nothing, have been nothing but supportive. But ultimately, uh, it comes down to, uh, to the central government stance on things. So while we have a lot of friends in the bureaucracies and a lot of understanding in the bureaucracies, uh, on the high level, politicians are much more uh, timid to, uh, to step over um, for obvious reasons. They don't want to be associated with drug trafficking and, you know, with all of this. And uh, they're taking their, their cues probably from higher entities like the European Union uh, or the, the recent uh, UN decision on, on CBD and so on. I think legislation uh, in terms of business risks is one of the biggest risks that we currently have to, to handle. Uh, at this time, the Portuguese government is uh, making new laws. They have given uh, an institution in Portugal called Infarmed, which is uh, the main agency for the regulation of pharmaceuticals uh, in Portugal, uh, the task of regulating uh, the entire hemp business which, of course, is already pointing, uh, in a way, uh, to uh, pharmaceutical companies. I mean, uh, if you have this agency and the pharmaceutical companies have dealt with them for years, who do you think will have an easier yeah. access to them, an easier time? And so corporations uh, have always uh, done this and will always do this, and we have to be very aware of this. Uh, they abuse the law to get their way with things. So at the moment, they are trying to muscle into the legislation. They're trying to regulate CBD as a drug. 
uh, they're trying to do everything they can to suppress uh, the upcoming hemp industry from small and medium-sized uh, businesses for the simple reason that if it is a regulated scheduled drug, they have the means to handle the situation while smaller growers do not. And this is again where a cooperative can come in and say, okay, we pool our resources and we will compete. We will be here. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, uh, in, in any, any way you slice it, uh, this situation will only be survived or, or grow into something good for small farmers, uh, medium-sized farmers, if uh, we cooperate. And uh, that, is, that is one of the reasonings. Lusicana is exactly uh, created for this purpose. We have to be able to uh, play with the, with the others or play against the others that are in the markets, uh, individual rich people, corporations. And our only means to do that is to link up, yeah. link shoulders. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. It's the age of community, isn't it? And, and cooperation and collaboration. And I think it's, it's so important. The other part of that, of course, uh, as I'm sure you, 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 I mean, you've alluded to this already, but it's the social regeneration part, isn't it? If people's imaginations, especially high up in government, can see the potential for, for social and economic regeneration on a local small scale, that, that must be a really good path ahead as well. Because the, you know, the, the siphoning of, of profits to a minority of people who don't even live in the country probably – can't, can't be good for the long-term prosperity of a country, can it? You know, the, uh, the pink doors uh, chain and continent, uh, uh, these are, you, you know, anyway here, supermarket chains. They yeah. uh, pay their taxes in the Netherlands. <laughs> yes. I mean, uh, you know, if, if this, is, this is ridiculous and, yeah. and, it, and it's got to stop. But on the other hand, you have to see who is the, the political... Uh, a mass that you're maneuvering, the inertia that you're trying to maneuver. These are people that have been on handouts for forever. Yeah. And uh, they've been, they were very happy with the status quo because they have been living in the status quo and gain from the status quo forever. There are some new parties here, uh, like Bloch Skerda, for instance, who have been very supportive. But even the communists, for example, who you would on some level expect to support this, uh, are fighting it. Really? Yes, uh, because uh, they are all benefactories of the, the status quo. And uh, in, in turn, again, it's a generational problem. Until these people are gone, things will probably move a little slower. Yeah. And this is compounded by the fact that the demographic development in Portugal is very unfavorable to change at the moment. 25% of the last generation, if you count generations by 20-year intervals, so to speak, have left the country. A quarter of the young people, the qualified people, have left the country. And that is a catastrophic development yes. uh, for a demography. Yes. And if you go into villages around Castelo Branco, for instance, smaller villages here, uh, they are at least half empty, if not worse. Uh, they're falling into ruins, and uh, the people that remain are old, and they are not very likely to change their minds, are they now? No, it's true. It's true. I mean, and that's not a that's not a slight on them, is it? It's just the nature of getting and older and setting your ways. Yeah. Yes. The the favorite uh, or the the famous uh, saying goes: if you elect a conservative party in your youth, you're an idiot, and if you elect a, um, a left wing party in your old age, you're an idiot as well. <laughs> I've not heard that, but it makes immediate no. sense. Yes, uh, and uh, as you can see. You know, it will. There's an, an inertia here that we have to uh, that we have to deal with. Help will not come from politics unless we can pressure them uh, by demonstrating things uh, in a way that they can't resist it. So if we can say with hemp we make this amount of taxes and we can do this much good uh, and so on, uh, they will have no uh, arguments against it. Yes. And this is why it is so important to go into. Uh, the concelius, the freguesias, talk to the people there. Uh, we are going to hold a, a talk in, in the place where we are growing, trying to convince the old people of the benefits, uh, give uh, as much as we can in terms of information, maybe create jobs, already uh, created some, some money in the community by giving uh, tasks away from agriculture and so on, uh, and uh, been the talk for, of the village for a while. It is important we go and organize this on the lowest possible level to get the support of people and maybe create a change. We cannot do this by attacking uh, or pushing at the top level. That will yeah. never happen. Yeah, and, and it's understandable why people want to do that, isn't it? I mean, you know, there is, there is an aspect of outrage 
and um, revenge even and, and you know all sorts of em- high emotional factors that will be driving people but I really am so inspired by your grasp of this and the kind of ethics of the Lusicana movement and, and how it's working is it's long term it's educational it needs to persuade the the head and the heart and it's going to take a while and you're very I suppose practical about the economic and political realities that exist and, you, and I guess you have to be there's no point being outraged is there because that doesn't last very long indeed I've been part of the Occupy movement for a while I had my uh, uh, sort of dance with uh, rage and all of this kind of stuff yeah and uh, uh, while it is needed sometimes to uh, to get it off your chest in the long run, uh, building always beats destroying. Yeah, yeah, amazing. That, well, that might be a great place to um, to leave the, the the conversation for for now, anyway, because this is just going to grow and grow. Uh, p- pardon the uh, horticultural pun there, but how do people okay. register and get involved with you, Jürgen? Thank you so much for talking to me. By the way, what's the best way for people to to register their interest and get involved with the momentum of this? Uh, we have a Facebook group, uh, which is currently kind of semi-open, but you can find it and join. I have to caution, though, uh, at the moment, we're trying to work things out between the six of us and trying to get as much of the practical procedures into place to get the whole production uh, wrapped up and uh, sold. Uh, and once we have it all under control, we will open as many slots as possible. But uh, that will not be before first quarter next year. So uh, be patient. We're yeah. working hard. It took us eight months to uh, get from the first meeting to the constitution of the uh, of the cooperative. But I trust it will go a lot faster from now. All six of us are growing uh, at this point. We'll have a harvest and. Uh, and this is where, where the next steps uh, will be ironed out. Once we have the whole process from A to Z, uh, we'll have a guide uh, for new members that will make it very easy to onboard uh, and clear out all the steps that they need to do. And this is very important because if you, if you overlook even small details, you have the police on your property, which happened to people yeah. uh, that we know, and uh, they, were, they almost raided their entire crop. Uh, but with some help, uh, they managed to keep keep their stuff and keep going. But uh, uh, the law is very unforgiving when it comes to, to the procedures here. And uh, you need to be sure to have it all uh, under, under lock before you start with things. Yeah, okay. I'm sure you will. And, and that is the power again, isn't it, of, of collaboration, cooperation and working Indeed. together. Yeah. Indeed. Imagine uh, a good lawyer uh, will cost you... Uh, a lot of money if there's like 50 people chipping in uh, with this kind of situation uh, you can afford a good lawyer and things can be resolved wonderful and so lucy can l-u-s-i-c-a-n-n-a jürgen thank you so much for, for talking to us at uh, pure portugal yes thank you carl thanks a lot you're listening to the pure portugal podcast with news and information from and for the pure portugal community Find out more on Facebook or at pureportugal.co.uk. Olá e bem-vindo to the Pure Portugal podcast. Carl Munson here, talking about the things that make expats and settlers a little bit homesick. Most expats and settlers in Newlands have a list of food and drink they miss from back home. For Brits, of which I'm one, the list often includes Marmite, particular brands of biscuits or chocolate, and a good cup of tea to go with the biscuits and chocolate, and that orange steaming pile of comfort, baked beans. A million housewives every day Pick up a tin of beans and say Beans means times Now that ad campaign will most likely be burned into the subconscious of any Brits listening, affirming the connection made long ago in childhood. And the funny thing about baked beans, the British favourite tending to be Heinz beans, is that they are in fact an American invention, and they're not even baked. Now I understand they are canned raw and stewed in the tin like a mini pressure cooker. So it's probably a good job they dropped the controversial BPA plastic can liner back in 2001. Anyway, launched in 1901 as Heinz Baked Beans, the classic Heinz tin of haricots was produced in the US until 1928. Heinz Beans' first UK sales were at London's renowned Fortnum & Mason shop and production soon followed at a factory in Peckham, South London in 1905. The British lover of Heinz Beans was firmly established by the Second World War when the Ministry of 
food classified them as an essential food as part of its rationing system. By 1958, the Heinz factory in Kit Green, Wigan, UK was established, now one of the largest food factories in Europe, producing more than one billion cans of food annually, including the wind-inducing favourite, which now returns to America as an import. Pure Portugal's Claire Monson recently posted in the Facebook group, those in rural parts of Portugal know baked beans are practically black market currency in some areas hauled over in suitcases by friends and relatives i miss them such a lot i started making my own said claire the recipes need tweaking but it's possible to make them very close to the real deal actually if anything nicer and her favorite recipe being the one pot barbecue baked beans from the minimalist baker Uh, links to be provided Uh, inspired by this i tried making my own decentralized off-grid version too with simply a tin of indigenous compal brand haricots a vegetable stock cube a splash of ketchup water to thicken or thin and served on a lovely local pao de avo with either lashings of butter or local olive oil. My kids seem to like them, actually, or or at least uh, they indulged me. A further discussion in the Pure Portugal group had one commentator saying, yep, made them for Jacket Spud's vegan recipe, did them in the clay oven, and they came out yummy and smoky. Everyone loved them. Recipe to follow. Still waiting for that. Uh, Lisa uh, responded with, I've had great comments on a recipe that just calls for one large can of Bush's baked beans. That's another brand, a competitor to Heinz. Original or similar in your area. So get what you can. One potato shredded finely. Molasses, half to three quarters of a cup. A similar amount of catsup uh, or ketchup, that would be. uh, Plus garlic and or onion powder to taste. And you can add sautéed onions or cooked bacon if you like. Potato sounds weird, but is good, she adds. I'm from the south in the US, so I know baked beans. This has become my big cheat recipe. Susan said, uh, chop and gently fry an onion, add garlic, paprika, chilli and a bit of curry paste or powder. Add a tube or tin of tomato paste, a dash of soy sauce and a tin of tomatoes. Then add some harico or cannellini beans and simmer to thicken. Ricardo suggested a vegan three bean chilli as a good option, saying you can use the beans you prefer. And goodness knows there is a good range of beans, both dried and tinned over here in Portugal. Uh, Pure Portugaler Olivia recommends Hemsley and Hemsley's smoky baked beans recipe. They use broth and ghee, she says, but I would replace that for vegans, maybe with a veg stock and olive oil. So I hope you enjoy Enjoy and even try those recipes and this leaves me wondering what expats and settlers from other countries miss so maybe you could let me know it also reminds me what a great source pure portugal can be when you need to beg an important question like this of the hive mind stay tuned to the pure portugal group on facebook and subscribe to the pure portugal podcast at pureportugal.co.uk forward slash podcast carl munson signing off take care até breve You're listening to the Pure Portugal podcast with news and information from and for the Pure Portugal community. Find out more on Facebook or at pureportugal.co.uk.